Now, I've chosen Things I've Learned is my title. And I believe that God uses his people to reveal himself to us is one of the methods. And because of that, and the spirit of this convention where the speakers share it personally so that you get to know them better, and because of today's theme verse, Matthew 6, 25, 26, talking about trusting our Father in heaven for the things of our lives, I'm sharing things that have had a profound effect in my own personal life. So God reveals himself through his word, through the power of his Holy Spirit, through his care over us, or providence, and through his people. Now, when it comes to his word, we think automatically of 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All scripture is inspired by God. Profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training. And we know that the more we put our noses into the scriptures and the volumes of the reprints, the more familiar we become with God's word and the greater the impact it's going to have in our lives. There's an expression that says, read the Bible through once and you're on your way to mastering the Bible. Read it through a second time and it's on its way to master you. Now regarding the power of the, of the Holy Spirit, Brother Bob just mentioned a little bit of that. But, you know, we in the volume five, the, the atonement between God and man, we're told that this spirit may be an energy of life, such as in the creative process, maybe a power of thought, such as the Holy Spirit revealed in Acts 13. It may be a creating and inspiring thoughts and words, or it may be a quickening or life-giving power. And it is man, as it was manifest in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And it will again be manifest in the resurrection of the church and the body. So the power of the Holy Spirit can work many different ways, but God reveals himself through this spirit. When we talk about his providence over us, you and I have all had experiences where we have seen God's hand in our lives. And I personally have had so many providences that when I share some of them with friends or family or witnessing, the automatic reaction is your guardian angel has certainly been watching over you. And, you know, my, when I, if I were to enumerate some of my experiences, some would be to my credit and some would be to my shame. Because sometimes I didn't discern God's providence until a much later point in time. Even when he answered, in one case, he answered a very specific prayer and within 30 minutes. And it took me 10 days to discern that he'd answered that prayer. And then lastly, I came to learn that God reveals himself to us through his people, the community with which we meet together in study and in worship. And we, we all have learned something from somebody else in fellowship. We all have watched brethren go through experiences and been encouraged by the way they conducted themselves. And we've all heard a discourse, and we think we might have thought that that discourse was written for me. And that is the example of God working through, revealing himself to his people, the community with which we meet together in study and worship. However, God can't do that if we're not meeting together. Then we become isolationists, and we don't have no way to bounce and correct ourselves against when we're, when we're independently meeting worshiping. So that's how God reveals himself. But the next thing I want to talk about is balancing life. Now, I, in my life, grew up hearing that we should put God first. In fact, that's the first of the Ten Commandments. And then we should put Christ first. And that's what Matthew 16, 24 says. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever saves his life shall lose it, and whoever loses life for my sake shall find it. That's verse 25. So my interpretation of that was the metaphor that's illustrated right here. I thought that meant that I would put Christ on the balance scale, and I'd put life, all of life on the other side, and my goal is to always make it Christ heavy. And I thought if I could do that, I'd be successful. Well, the problem was the reality of life is such that my life anyway was that I could not keep it Christ heavy on the balance scale. And I 
started looking at all the different aspects of my life. And there's eight of them, I believe there. The world record for juggling balls is seven in one rotation, seven. And there's eight things there. And I didn't have any difficulty finding those eight things. Those are all the things in, in my life. And I'm pretty positive that they're in your life too. Well, it wasn't Christ heavy anymore. It was everything else but Christ heavy. And I finally came to realize that I was using the wrong metaphor. And that there was a much more accurate and therefore better metaphor for putting God and Christ first in life. And this next slide portrays my new life metaphor. And it's simply putting Christ in the center of everything that I have to do. And when I started implementing that, a couple of things happened in my own personal life. First of all, I found a greater peace than I had before. And secondly, because I was looking to put Christ in the middle of everything, the center of everything that I did, Christ became first, but what surprised me, and I shouldn't have been surprised, but it did, was that I had so many more witness opportunities. And I would just start talking about the Lord Jesus, and I'd share some of these things that I'm sharing with you today. And they would ask me for my notes. Many times I'd write it out on the napkin. They asked for, my, for the napkin and take it away. And it didn't matter. I was at the eye doctor. I was in the, the store. I was anywhere. If they had ear, hearing ear, I was willing to share. But it wasn't until I started putting Christ first in the center of everything and threw away my old metaphor. So that's, that's something I learned. I want to balance life. The next lesson that was a major thing for me was I learned to stay in the experience. Now, we all have a comfort zone. And that's represented by this larger diagram, orange one. And we all naturally center ourselves. It's that little red dot. We center ourselves in the middle of our comfort zone. But sometimes and often, God pushes us to our experiences to the edges of our comfort zone. Well, if we stay in that place, then we will grow. And if we don't, we retreat back to where it's safe, where we're in our comfort zone, then we lose the opportunity of growth. So this is what happens when we stay within the zone that God pushes us towards. I didn't change the red mark. I did not change the blue mark. But you see, the circle of my comfort zone is significantly large because the human propensity says, I'm going to recenter myself. And so the blue represents this new experience God is leading, giving me. I've decided, committed to stay within that experience. And now I've expanded my comfort zone. So when we look at some of the old and the New Testament characters, many of them, and you can see some of the names there, stayed within the experience that they had. Noah. God asked him to build the ark. He stayed in, the, he stayed in that experience, and it saved his life. Abraham promised the land. He left, went to the nation of Egypt, got in trouble, came back. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. You know, Joseph stayed in his experiences. David. David was promised to be the king. And yet Saul chased him all around Israel. Well, how would a poor, simple shepherd know what Israel was like if he hadn't been chased around? And how would he know who he could put in his cabinet if he hadn't collected 600 men and their families around him and gotten to know them on a daily basis? So those experiences prepared David to be the next king of Israel. The Lord Jesus, where would he be if Jesus did not stay on the cross? The apostle Paul stayed within the experiences. And it comes down to the last one is me. Am I willing to stay in my experience? Now, sometimes I struggle, but I have learned that when I stay in the experience that has given me, whether I like it or not, there's a blessing inside of it somewhere. It's up to me to find it. So that's how God reveals himself, the balancing of life, staying in the experience. And the last one I want to talk about is the power of perspective. And you can easily just say it simply with think vertically, not horizontally. And the 10 spies and two spies of Israel are a good example. All 12 went and saw the land. All 12 came back and gave a report. 10 of the spies compared the Canaanites to the Israelites. 
We did a horizontal comparison. And in that comparison, Canaanites and Israelites, they were right. Two of the spies compared the Canaanites to the Heavenly Father. And in that comparison, they were right. But God honored the two spies report and not the 10 spies. So we need to think vertically. And the perspective that we take will determine our spiritual success. That's how important this lesson that I had to learn is. So we also may have heard the expression, what controls the mind also controls the man. If I can get my thinking right, I'm going to get my behavior right. If I'm thinking spiritually, I'm going to act spiritually. And we want to learn to train our mind to see God in everything. So we have a couple of verses, John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that you may know, that we may, they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Again, this is looking for the Heavenly Father and everything. And in Acts 22, verse 14, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. Now, this is not taking a little bit out of context, but because we are and claim to be sons of God, we can also claim that our Father wants to reveal himself to us, and he will do so. So we have to watch for his hand. Now, there's a couple of quotes that I really like. Um, the one that's really been a guide and stepping stone for me is, man, don't let anybody walk through your mind with dirty feet. So if somebody says something, somebody does something, I can decide how I'm going to react to it. I can go to the gutter or I can go to the righteous side. Don't let anybody else walk through your mind with dirty feet. The period of greatest gain is in knowledge and experience is the most difficult period in our, in our lives. This is that point of staying within the experience because... The period of greatest gain in knowledge and experience, in knowledge and experience, is also the most difficult process for us. The opposite of patience is not impatience. The opposite of patience is unbelief. Now think about what that means. When I am not patient with an experience, it means that I am not trusting my Father in heaven, which means I don't have the faith to let Him have sovereignty in my life. And we never know how strong we are until being strong is the only choice that I have left. When our back's against the wall, we have to do something, right? But our Father doesn't want us to back up, doesn't want to back us up against the wall. He wants us to be willing. And the experiences are so much easier if we're willing to learn than if we're forced to learn. Another couple more is those who do everything in God's hand, we eventually see God's hand in everything. And when we put our problems in God's hands, he puts his peace in our hearts and in our minds. And that comes back to our Matthew 6, 24 and 25. Why are you anxious about your life? Why are you anxious about your clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't reap. They don't sow. They don't gather in barns, but they're your father and takes care of them. How much more value are you than they are? If we are rooted in Christ, we will not be uprooted in crisis. And we will not be uprooted in trial, and we will not be uprooted in temptation. And that's predicated on the fact that we have a firm foundation. In our last and closing slide, when we talk about our relationship with our Father, we're really talking about a process. Now, in our chart of the ages, we know that if you go horizontally, we're talking periods of time. If you go vertically, you're talking relationship. And it's the same thing here in this chart. We start out in the past, in, in, in sin, and our walk is that vertical, or is that diagonal line going from sin to perfection. That's what we're trying to accomplish from the past, the present, to the future. Our goal is perfection. But our faith in our Heavenly Father is the vehicle that we use to sanctify this process and go through this sanctification process. And love is the fuel that drives that vehicle, that motivates that vehicle. The more I love my father, the more faith I'm gonna have, the further I'm going to try to climb that mountain of sanctification reaching perfection. So just real quickly to summarize. 
things that I've learned have been really pivotal to me is to listen for and listen to his voice. The second thing is to center Christ in all things in my life. And sometimes, you know, we get on the plane, we trust the plane with our lives, but we won't trust him with our laundry. I'm tr- we need to, and I'm trying to center Christ in everything in life. Stay in the experience. Watch for his hand, looking forward to the growth that it's going to bring. Why are you why having this experience? Now, why me? Why not me? But what is he trying to teach me? What am I supposed to learn here? And then lastly, strive to adopt God's perspective. Because I think and believe that that is the most critical thing in our lives that we can do. And probably the single most important thing that will determine whether or not we are successful in our Christian life.